After watching this video, you should be able to describe glycogenolysis or glycogen breakdown, including listing the major locations where glycogen breakdown occurs, describe a little bit about the structure of glycogen, including the types of um, glycosidic bonds, also, recall the important key enzymes that are either targets of, of regulation or disease and describe the regulation of glycogen breakdown in the fasting and well-fed state. And since we're talking about glucagon and insulin, that's mostly just glycogen uh, regulation, glycogen breakdown regulation in the liver. Now, let's take a look at the big picture and you can see here that glycogen breakdown is grouped with gluconeogenesis, fatty acid oxidation, and ketogenesis. All of these are going to be turned on in the fasting state. And the counterparts, the opposite reactions, glycolysis, which is the opposite of gluconeogenesis, glycogenesis, which is the opposite of glycogenolysis, and fatty acid synthesis, the opposite of fatty acid oxidation, all of those guys are going to be um, going in the other direction, right? So when you're in a fasting state, all of these reactions on the right are going to be turned on. All of these reactions on the left are going to be turned off. And when you're fasting, you're also going to have low insulin, which is going to help play into that. And when you're in the well-fed state, everything's just reversed. Right? You have lots of insulin around. It's turning on all these reactions over here on the left and helping turn off all these reactions here on the right. Okay, So this is just a review of where all these reactions fit in um, in terms of the liver. Now, if we go and take another look again at how these reactions would tie together in the liver, we can see that it boils down to glucose going in and out of the liver. That's a really easy way to think about it. You can see here when you're fasting, glucose needs to leave the cell to help supply the plasma to prevent hypoglycemia. And that glucose is going to come from G6-phosphate, which is either going to be coming from pyruvate, which would you would have gotten from glucogenic amino acids like alanine or lactate, um, and glycogen breakdown, which is the focus of this lecture. So you can see the glycogen in green here going to G6-phosphate. That is going to help supply a nice steady source of glucose, at least for the first day or so over fast. Okay. Now, um, we see over here that in the well-fed state, glucose is going to be going into the liver through the same transporter, the GLUT2 transporter, and it's going to be phosphorylated by glucokinase, and in addition to going down the glycolytic pathway, it's going to go through gly glycogen synthesis or glycogenesis, pentose phosphate shunt, where you're going to be building up glycogen stores, you're going to be making fatty acids, cholesterol, and triglycerides, and all, all of that is going to be the um, type of reactions you're going to want when you've had a meal and glucose is high and insulin is high. Okay, and I just want to point out, um, and this is something that we've discussed uh, a few times already in, in other videos, that when one of the reactions is on, the opposite reaction is off. So when we have, in the well-fed state, glycogen synthesis turned on, at the same time we're going to have glycogen breakdown turned off. And the same is true in the fasting state. When glycogen breakdown is turned on, we're going to have glycogen synthesis turned off. And that makes sense because we wouldn't want to go to the trouble of breaking down glycogen just to go and build it back up again, right? We want the, that cycle of glycogen synthesis and breakdown to be occurring in periods of fasting and well-fed state. Okay, so now let's take a look um, and review glycogen synthesis first before we look at glycogen breakdown. So um, glycogen synthesis okay remember occurs in the liver and skeletal muscle and you can see that glucose goes in through glucose transporters the transporters are a little different in skeletal muscle it's this regulated GLUT4 trans transporter that responds to insulin signaling remember there's a video on insulin effects where insulin binds its RTK it goes through a series of events PI3 kinase ultimately um, helping translocate these glucose transporters to the surface when there's lots of glucose around triggering insulin secretion. In the liver, it's a constitutively present glucose transporter, GLUT2, that does the same kind of idea, taking facilitated diffusion, glucose going down as concentration gradient. So never, never mind the type of glucose transporter, once you get into the, in, into the liver skeletal muscle, it's all the same stuff from there. We have glucose being phosphorylated by glucokinase, which is the first step of glycolysis. And then we need to build up our glycogen, our branch glycogen, and we have our phosphoglucomutase, which makes our G1P. That's a reversible enzyme. We use 
um, UTP to, to make this UDP glucose to donate the glucose to the growing glycogen chain. Glycogen synthase makes the chain longer, and then we have our branching enzyme, which makes these branches. Okay, and so remember that the regulated enzyme in glycogen synthesis was glycogen synthase. It was phosphorylated by PKA and turned off, and that's what we would expect in the fasting state. Glycogen synthase in, under these conditions when we're building up glucose obviously needs to be turned on. We'd have hot, lots of insulin around, and we'd have low glucagon. So this, this is really just uh, a review of the, a real quick review of the glycogen synthetic pathway. Now let's take uh, our attention over to glycogen breakdown. And I want to just point out that there's some differences here. Um, you know, you see skeletal muscle and liver again, but notice that if we're, we're using the example of fasting, okay, and, and we're going to assume we're fasting and not exercising and not contracting our skeletal muscles, we notice that the GLUT4 transporter is not present, okay, and that would make sense because we have low glucagon, we have lots of insulin, I'm sorry, uh, other way around, if we're fasting we have lots of glucagon and then we have low insulin, and remember we need insulin to help translocate those GLUT4 transporters to the surface. So that's why we don't see GLUT4 here, because this is an example of fasting, okay? And the other thing that you might notice is that um, we don't have, um, you know, we don't have any glucose, uh, glucose 6-phosphate going to glucose here, and that's because the skeletal muscle lacks the, the uh, glucose 6-phosphatase enzyme, which is a gluconeogenic enzyme, to convert G6-phosphate to glucose. So there are some differences here, and I just want to point out that glycogen breakdown in skeletal muscle is, is, is very much stimulated by skeletal muscle contraction and, and perhaps also some circulating epinephrine, which binds to beta-2 receptors on skeletal muscle that might be triggering glycogen breakdown to occur. But the difference here is that when you, when you break down the glycogen in skeletal muscle, it needs to go down a glycolytic pathway to make ATP for skeletal muscle contraction. Remember, we discussed in the liver when glycogen breakdown is turned on, glycolysis is turned off. So that's, that's a big difference between liver and skeletal muscle. And so we're not going to go into very much more detail about skeletal muscle, okay, um, but it is, it, is, it is regulated a different way and it also doesn't have some of the things that the liver has going on. So we go and turn our attention to the liver. We see that when we're fasting, we want glucose to leave the liver cell. That glucose is going to come ultimately from G6-phosphate. We have this extra special enzyme in this picture here. It's a gluconeogenic enzyme. It's a preview for gluconeogenesis that dephosphorylates glucose. All right? And you also might notice that we don't have glucose going back to G6-phosphate because that's glucokinase. And remember, without any insulin around in the fasting state, we don't have glucokinase induced. That's a review of the regulation of glycolysis lecture. And so when we're taking G6-phosphate and going back to glucose, we wouldn't want it to go and get rephosphorylated again. So while glucose 6-phosphatase is active, it makes sense that glucokinase wouldn't be around. And we already know from the, the, the slide I just showed you, uh, the, the summary of the reactions, that, glu that glycolysis is turned off in the liver when we're breaking glycogen down. Okay? So where does this G6-phosphate come from? Well, when we're talking about glycogen breakdown, it's coming from G1P. Okay, remember G1P is an intermediate in glycogen synthesis as well, and um, that G1P is going to be formed by this very important enzyme, glycogen phosphorylase, which is a, a highly regulated enzyme uh, um, in this pathway. And what it uses is an inorganic phosphate to hydrolyze these alpha 1 4 glycosidic bonds, forming the G1P. So that phosphate, you know, is going to be. Um, in the form coming off as this G1 phosphate. And so we, we are going to take this G1 phosphate, it's going to go the, the same uh, enzyme, it's going to go the other direction that we had in glycogen synthesis, the phosphoglucomutase enzyme, forming the G6P so that it can go off and get dephosphorylated by G6-phosphatase, make glucose, and go out of the cell. Now, what happens with glycogen phosphorylase is that it, do, it, it doesn't degrade glycogen completely. In fact, when you get to these branch points where there's a few coming off a branch, that's called a limit dextrin, and glycogen phosphorylase 
doesn't uh, work on, on this limit dextrin uh, piece. And so if we really want to maximize our, our glycogen and, and release all the glucose we can, we need to do something with this limit dextrin. And so we need another enzyme. And that enzyme is special. It's, it's called the debranching enzyme. It has, it has bifunctionality. All right. So that means it has two enzyme properties. And remember, as a review, um, if you go back to the um, regulation of glycolysis, there's another bifunctional enzyme. Uh, it's the uh, PFK2 fructose bisphosphatase 2 that's a very important regulatory enzyme in glycolysis. And, that was a, and that's another example of a bifunctional enzyme where you have, a, you have a single protein that has two enzyme functionalities. Anyway, the debranching enzyme, the first thing that it's going to do is it's going to use a 4-4 transferase activity it's going to cleave an alpha-1,4 bond from this, from this limit dextrin, right? And it's going to cut that off, and it's just going to paste it and, and uh, make an alpha-1,4 bond. So it's just cutting and pasting these three guys coming off this limit dextran and then um, actually elongating the, the glycogen molecule a little bit, okay? And you see what's left is this alpha-1,6 glycosidic bond, and it actually has the ability to cleave that off. And when it does that, it uses water and just hydrolyzes that bond and releases free glucose. Okay, so most of the glycogen breakdown, you need to have glucose 6-phosphatase working, that's a gluconeogenic enzyme, to get that glucose to get out of the cell. Because most of, the, um, most of that, that um, glucose 6-phosphate and, and glucose is going to come from G1Ps coming off. Okay, and there's a little bit from the debranching enzyme second function that kind of releases some free glucose, but most of it's in the form of this G1P, which requires this other enzyme to really get this glucose to come out. Now, in terms of enzymes, there's two important ones here. The glycogen phosphorylase, again, is important because it's regulated. We're going to talk about that. And the debranching enzyme, okay, is important. It's bifunctional, and it's also a site of, of a disease, okay? And so... Um, there's, a, there's another glycogen storage disorder called Cori's disease where there's a problem with the debranching enzyme. Either it's a problem with the first function, um, the 4,4 transferase or alpha-1,6 glucosidase function. And either way, you can see that in the liver, if you had a problem with the debranching enzyme, you wouldn't be able to mobilize glycogen very well. You'd have some hypoglycemia and you'd have some problems in the liver. Okay, And just as since we're talking about glycogen storage diseases, I'll just point out that um, not in the liver, but in skeletal muscle, and, and skeletal muscle, of course, has glycogen phosphorylase. That's where these G1Ps would come from. There's another glycogen storage disease type 5 called McArdle's, McArdle syndrome, which is a problem with glycogen phosphorylase in skeletal muscle. And you can imagine that those individuals would have muscle problems. They'd have weakness. They wouldn't be able to get glucose mobilized to get energy for muscle contractions, and they have all kinds of muscle problems. So, um, you know, these enzymes... Uh, are important because they do show up in certain disorders. Okay, and, and the, the whole class of disorders, that there's problems with glycogen, are called glycogen storage disorders, and, and those are good to think about, um, to, to think about the physiology and the biochemistry here. Now, if we go back to our first um, discussion of uh, what we were going to do in this lecture, we've discussed the major locations in the liver and skeletal muscle. We've reviewed the, the structure, this branched um, nature of glycogen with the alpha-1,6 and alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds. And now finally, the regulation is going to be important. Um, and, and we're going to include it here because even though it's, it's a little more complicated than glycogen synthesis regulation, it's certainly less complicated than glycolysis regulation because we have a single enzyme uh, as part of the pathway that's important and pKa is involved. And it's the only thing that makes it... Um, a little extra more difficult, not a lot, is that pKa indirectly affects glycogen phosphorylase. Okay, and the way it does it is it phosphorylates an enzyme called glycogen phosphorylase kinase, which, um, as the name implies, is a kinase that phosphorylates glycogen phosphorylase. And we can predict what would happen to glycogen phosphorylase, you know, and, and, um, and, uh, because it's going to get phosphorylated and say, well, was it going to be turned on or turned off? So if we go back again to our schematic here, we know when glucagon's around, we have lots of pKa, we have lots of phosphorylation, and we know glycogenolysis should be turned on. So if pKa is activating an intermediate kinase, which is going to phosphorylate glycogen phosphorylase, we know ultimately 
the glycogen phosphorylase needs to be turned on because we need glycogen breakdown to be turned on. So uh, contrast that with in glycogen, synth synth uh, glycogen synthesis that when pKa is around, glycogen synthase is phosphorylated and turned off. So that's how we have glycogen breakdown turned on and glycogen synthesis turned off when we have lots of glucagon around. Okay, and so we go back. If we were to summarize this, when we're in the fasting state, we got lots of glucagon. Glucagon hits its receptor on the liver. Cyclic AMP and pKa go up. Glycogen phosphorylase. Um, kinase is turned on, and then it phosphorylates glycogen phosphorylase, and then that turns that on, turning on glycogen breakdown. When we have the well-fed state, we have low glucagon levels because insulin from the beta cell is going to inhibit um, alpha cell secretion of glucagon. And if there's less glucagon, there's less pKa, uh, uh, cyclic AMP and pKa in the liver. And the glycogen phosphorylase is going to be in the dephosphorylated state. And when that, when that occurs, it's going to be off. Okay, so this is how we turn glycogen breakdown on and glycogen breakdown off. And again, it's through this intermediate kinase, glycogen phosphorylase kinase. Okay, now the final thing I'm going to tell you is a kind of a bonus. Um, we, didn't, we didn't go into um, alternate mechanisms of glycogen breakdown. Okay, so what we've talked about in the liver and skeletal muscle, um, all that's occurring in the cytosol with the exception of glucose 6-phosphatase, which happens to be a gluconeogenic enzyme anyway. It's located in the endoplasmic reticulum, and we'll discuss that when we, when we, when we discuss gluconeogenesis. Um, but there, are, there is a tiny, tiny bit of glycogen breakdown that occurs in lysosomes. It's a different enzyme pathway. It, it uses an enzyme called um, alpha-1,4-glucosidase, or acid maltase. And the lysosomes, if they're deficient in this enzyme, they can't uh, degrade glycogen very well. And what happens is you get an accumulation of glycogen in these abnormal vacuoles in these lysosomes, and you get dysfunction of the places where this would be occurring, which would be mostly the liver and skeletal muscle, and there's a little bit of, of this lysosomal stuff that occurs in the heart. There's a little bit of glycogen metabolism in the heart, but when this disorder happens, um, they get a lot of problems with the heart. They get cardiomegaly and, and other problems like that. So um, keep that in mind. Um, that's called type 2 glycogen storage disorder, uh, Pompe's disease. And, um, you know, you put it all together, there's a number of glycogen storage disorders that we've discussed in these two videos on glycogen metabolism. We've discussed, um, we've discussed McArdle's syndrome, we've discussed Corey's disease, Pompe's disease, and Anderson's disease. And um, when we talk about gluconeogenesis, we'll discuss another glycogen storage disease, which has to do with um, a, a problem in the gluconeogenic enzyme. So hopefully, now you can describe glycogenolysis, the basic pathway, know the major locations of the liver and skeletal muscle, describe the structure the, with the branches at the alpha-1,6 and, and all the alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds, and how we regulate glycogen metabolism in the liver in the fasting and well-fed state with, uh, with primarily thinking about glucagon being up or down affecting pKa regulation of the glycogen phosphorylase kinase. And that concludes this lecture on glycogenolysis.